Hey everybody, it's Will here. Welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence YouTube channel. Hope you guys are all doing well. Today we're going to start with our on-chain analysis tutorial. This is a series that I'm really excited to share with you guys. I hope you get some value out of it. Before we get started, we'd really appreciate if you could hit the subscribe button, the like button, just to kind of help kind of pump this content out into the YouTube algorithm and spread that Bitcoin knowledge, as well as just leave a comment below uh, as to you know what's your feedback on this video and what other metrics would you like to see covered moving forward? You know, be that on-chain, uh, derivatives driven, or even price action. Whatever you'd like to see a video on, I'm happy to do it for you guys. Let's first start with today, what is on-chain analysis before we get into the actual metric that we're gonna be covering today? Um, on-chain analysis is essentially looking at the blockchain. So the blockchain is a recorded you know, ledger of all the transactions throughout Bitcoin's history. With this information, we can do different data science or data heuristics, run over the information and come to different conclusions about what's going on with different entities on the blockchain and in Bitcoin's market. So we can do different things like look at the size of what entity, you know, what are whales doing? What is retail doing? We can look at the statistical spending behavior of an entity. We can say, you know, is supply moving to entities that have a low likelihood to spend their coins, AKA strong hands. And also we can look at the time that they've been in the market and evaluate uh, you know, entities based off of that. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be looking at long-term holder supply and long-term holder behavior. Uh, and so to start with that, let's first talk about what defines a long-term holder. So the first chart we have here is looking at the probability of a coin being spent based off the time that a coin has been held in a wall. So what we see is that over time, the underlying pattern here is that over time, the longer a coin has been held in a wallet, the lower the likelihood is that that coin is then going to be spent out of that wallet again. And so you'll see that over time, this probability trends down as we go out from 400 to 600 to all the way out to 1,000 days. At 155 days, what we find or, or what Class Note has found is that the statistical likelihood of those coins being spent drops off the most. And that's highlighted by that dotted line on the left-hand side. And so that's what we use for the long-term holder supply cutoff. That's what we use to deem if an entity is a long-term holder. So that's very key to understand in terms of what makes up an, a long-term holder. Next, we look at the long and short-term holder classification. So this is looking at the weighting factor that's given uh, to classify an entity as long or short-term holder. Um, and so what we're, what we're essentially looking at here is that there's not a hard stop at 155 days. We have this kind of smoothing transition from uh, kind of this 10 day window between 155 days from 145 days to 165 days. And this is just so that you don't see, you know, an immediate transition as soon as an entity hits 155 days of supply from short to long-term holders. So you have this kind of smoothing factor, weighting factor that's given to have a smooth transition between both cohorts. So now that we've talked about some of the data science and heuristics behind what makes a long-term and short-term holder, let's talk about the actual patterns and underlying dynamics of the metrics. So first we're looking at long-term holders. So the kind of key underlying dynamic to understand here is that long-term holders scale into weakness. They don't perfectly time the bottoms. They scale into weakness and they scale out into strength. They distribute into strength. So to start, we have green, the green line, which is long-term holder supply. We have gray, which is Bitcoin's price. And we have these arrows that I've, that I've drawn over the metric. So the blue is just showing that long-term holders are scaling into weakness. And we have the red, the red arrows, which are showing that long-term holders are scaling out into strength. So if we go back to 2013, what we see is that before the first 2013 pump, long-term holders were locking up supply and accumulating. Into that first of the two 2013 double pumps, they distributed their coins. In between those two rallies and that kind of mini bear between the two 2013 double pumps, long-term holders reaccumulated re their coins really aggressively. Heading back into that second pump, long-term holders then distributed their coins once again. Into the 2014-2015 bear, long-term holders accumulated their Bitcoin very aggressively. Heading back into the 2016-2017 bull run, long-term holders distributed again into strength. Long-term holder supply bottomed out along with the 2017 peak, and then they started accumulating again, heading into the 2018-2019 bear. Their holdings peaked out at the bottom of the bear. They started distributing again into that mini bull run up to, to 14,000 in 2019, and they started distributing again into that rally. 
After that, heading into 2020, they reaccumulated again. Into about September, October of 2020, they then started distributing their coins once again. And then the distribution peaked out along with Bitcoin's price. Once Bitcoin's price peaked out and started to roll over, long-term holders, what did they do? They started accumulating again into that weakness. Long-term holder supply peaked out when we kind of had that second move up to about 69,000. Uh, and then on that fake out move down, they then kind of slowed their spending, right? Because then we, we had price weakness. So long-term holders started slowing down their spending slash reaccumulating their coins once again. And that's kind of where we're hanging out now in terms of this metric. Next, we're gonna look at long-term holder net position change. So again, this is looking at the same dynamics we just talked about with long-term holders. But instead of just looking at the raw balance of the holders, we're looking at the net position, 30-day net position change, which means we're looking at what was long-term holder supply at 30 days ago, and what is it now, and what's the net difference between the two. And so we get the same dynamics that we, we looked at a second ago. So you'll see that long-term holder net position, net position change draws down substantially during major Bitcoin peaks. So the two 2013 double, double pumps, we saw long-term holder supply uh, net position change draw down aggressively. In between those two double pumps, you saw an aggressive accumulation period. Heading into the 2014 bear, you saw another aggressive reaccumulation period. Heading into the 2018 bear, we saw an aggressive reaccumulation period. And over the summer of 2021, we saw, again, another really aggressive reaccumulation period. And as you can see, like right now, we're, we're heading back into another accumulation period, but we're just kind of popping into this green area. But as we touched on, again, long-term holders accumulate into, into weakness, scale out into strength. So we moved up to all-time highs. They started to sell the coins that they reaccumulated over summer 2021. And then as we had that kind of failed move down and started Bitcoin's price started moving back down, currently at 40K, they started slowing down that spending. And now they're reaccumulating again, shown by the green here in the, on the, on the right-hand side. So we talked about what long-term holder dynamics look like. Now let's look at short-term holders, and then we'll kind of put it all together. So conversely to long-term holders, short-term holders scale out into weakness slash age into long-term holders, and they scale into strength. So what does this mean? Short-term holders are the newer market participants. Again, they're younger than 155 days. So a lot of times, this just means that these are new speculators in the Bitcoin market. A lot of this is just you know people who are coming in for Bitcoin's, as we call it, number go up technology, right? They're only in it because of, uh, because of price appreciation. Perhaps they don't even have a real kind of underlying thesis for Bitcoin as an investment or asset class. And so we see short-term holder supply increase into strength. And, and at the same time, as we talked about, long-term holders are distributing into that. So we have long-term holders essentially selling their bags to the short-term guys the whole way up. And then as we head back into the bear market, long-term holder supply increases. But as we're seeing here with short-term holder supply, short-term holder supply conversely is decreasing. So what does this mean? It means twofold. A, the speculators that only came up for price, that came into the market for price appreciation are leaving the market and capitulating, taking their losses and leaving. The second thing that we're seeing is this is really important to understand is that they're aging into long-term holders. So some of these entities come in and understand Bitcoin you know, during the bull market. So they come in because of price appreciation, but then they say, hold on, I think there's some actual validity to this as an asset class. They do research, do their due diligence, and they decide they're actually going to hold Bitcoin long-term. In this process, they age past that 155-day threshold into long-term holders. So when, short, when short-term holder supply is decreasing, it not only just means that short-term holders are capitulating, but it also means to an extent that short-term holders are aging into long-term holders. But a key dynamic to understand, though, is that in the bull market, short-term holders are buying as long-term holders are distributing. So short-term holders are essentially buying the long-term guys' bags the whole way up into strength. So now we've talked about both of these dynamics. Let's put it together. Let's, let's pull it all together. So here we have long-term holder supply in green, short-term holder supply in pink. And here we can really get a good understanding of kind of the underlying current that's driving this cyclical behavior of Bitcoin's market cycles. This, this is looking at the underlying behavior uh, or, or behavioral dynamics that are driving these cycles. And so when we put it all together, we see everything that we've talked about. So we see long-term holders buying into strength, 
I'm sorry, buying into weakness, selling into strength. And we see short-term holders buying into strength and selling into weakness slash aging into long-term holders. And so we see this kind of divergence between the two throughout Bitcoin's history. When one of these is doing one thing, the other is going in the opposite direction. And these cyclical waves are what's driving the underlying Bitcoin cyclical behavior. And so this is a really interesting chart just to understand the behavior that's driving Bitcoin over time. Next, we're going to look at a metric that I created with uh, Willy Wu over the summer. This is long-term holder supply shock. So as we talked about, long-term holders lock up supply at the bottom of the bear, and they, they basically set the floor at the bottom of the bear for the ensuing bull market. This metric really kind of highlights this dynamic. And so what we're doing is we're comparing long-term holders and short-term holders by dividing one by the other. And so what this does is it eliminates the upwards drift of long-term holder supply just based off of circulating supply increasing. So over years time, more Bitcoin is coming into circulation, is issued into circulation. So with that in mind, of course, long-term holder supply is going to have this upwards drift over time. What this metric does is it eliminates that upwards drift and it's just looking at the relative holding between short and long-term holders by comparing the two. And so by running this ratio, we get this interesting zone, which we call peak hodl, where long-term holders have locked up a substantial portion of supply relative to short-term holders. And that's the top of this kind of blue zone. So first of all, this blue zone, there's no science necessarily behind the specific zone here in terms of like entering it from the underside. I just threw this over the chart. So take it with a grain of salt in terms of, you know, when we enter this, the key, the key thing to understand is the peak. So whenever, whenever we get to this, what I call peak hodl area, that's when long-term holders have locked up a, a substantial portion of supply. So you'll see in July, 2015 up here, January, 2019 here, even at the, you know, even at the, the kind of mid to end of, of 2018 into 2019 here, uh, January, 2020, then we had COVID, which kind of threw this off. And we had another reaccumulation period before the bull run. And that's, you know, July, call it July to August, 2020. And then as well, recently in uh, August of 2021, we reached the highest that the metric has ever reached. On this move back up to all-time highs, you saw it decline, again, because long-term holders sell into strength. On that move to all-time highs, they started, as, na as, as usual behavior, started to scale out their holdings. But then once price action started to show weakness on that failed break above all-time highs, they have now started to slow out their spending. As you can see, this is kind of starting to bottom out and even has a bit of an upwards drift here over the last call it month or two. And so you've started to see a very slight reaccumulation, but at, you know, essentially just a slowdown in spending from those long-term holders. We're still very high relative to where peak hodl has been historically. But the key kind of underlying thing I wanted to highlight here is that long-term holders set the floor. They set the floor at the bottom of the bear in 2015. They set the floor at the bottom of the bear at, at the end of 2018 into 2019. They set the floor in the at the end of 2019 into 2020, got thrown off by COVID. We had another reaccumulation. And then finally, uh, they kind of set the floor heading into the bull run at the end of 2020. And they also set the floor at the bottom of summer over 20 in, in 2021. So this is kind of the underlying what we call, you know, peak hodl area where long-term holders have locked up a substantial portion of supply. And so there's, at that point, it's just about marginal demand kicking in to start seeing price appreciation. But from, remember, there's, there's supply and demand. So this is only speaking to the supply side, but it's still very important because long-term holders are setting the floor for the marginal demand to start stepping in and seeing that price appreciation at the bottom of the bear. Long-term holders, they hold the line. They set the floor at the bottom of the bear market. With that in mind, Let's look at some key takeaways to kind of wrap this up. So in, in this kind of the high level of everything we talked about, long-term holder supply is defined as an entity that has held their coins for over 155 days. Long-term holders accumulate into weakness and they scale out into strength. Long-term holder supply increases into weakness as they accumulate, plus as short-term holders age past the 155-day cutoff. And last thing I would throw in here that I, I just didn't throw in is that, you know, long-term holders set the floor at the bottom of the bear market, right? That's, that's a very important concept to understand through this metric that we just looked at here. With that being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed today's uh, intro video. 
And let me know what you thought, as I, as I said, and uh, any other metrics that you'd like to see covered moving forward, just drop a comment down below and let me know. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. Uh, please like, subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Take it easy.